everybody. Welcome back to No Excuses, and thank you for your patience and understanding that sometimes things just don't go so perfect. But who wants life to be so perfect? I want to, uh, well, what am I supposed to say right now? <laughs> I want to introduce my special guest, Josh Valentine, who has a great amount of stories to share with us. And importantly, he's got a life that's going to teach me a number of things. And there's so much going on. Josh, how are you this evening, my friend? Rodney, doing great. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. I'm glad you're here. You know, I enjoy the outdoors myself. And um, when I met you and we chatted, it was like, uh, I need more of the outdoors. <laughs> you know, it's life uh, as I know it to be anyway. I always encourage people to uh, enjoy nature and get out into nature, get out into nature as I try to talk with my teeth falling out of my face. I'm only kidding, folks. They are real. Knock, 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 knock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the importance, because as we know, our bodies are made with minerals and the earth has minerals. And pounding the pavement, as many of us do, is not really in harmony of, of our bodies and who we are as people. So, um, and importantly as well, with all the great things that you do in your lifestyle, uh, I also want to compliment uh, the part of that you're involved with ALS, which I know is not the easiest thing to get involved with, uh, because unfortunately, it's not always a happy ending, but there is great work to be done. Yeah, certainly not always a happy ending. Um not always the easiest thing to look at, but I will say that the experiences I've had within the ALS community have been unanimously uh, mind-blowing, for lack of a better word. You know, you get these individuals who have been saddled with really a situation that you'd be hard-pressed to mm -hmm. come up with something worse, and yet somehow they manage to find a way to be the most inspiring person in the room and the most positive sense of energy. So true. Sort of the one in a lot of situations I've found that's uh, showing the rest of us how to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and live right. life to the fullest. So and difficult, yes, but equally exactly. very moving. And, and how can that not epitomize um, no excuses? Uh, a life that people know that is going to be an extremely difficult challenge, but yet they move on. And we need to understand this because there's no reason for the rest of us not to be moving on. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, Josh, what I like to do with our guests, and I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to share with everybody, is to, I like to know a little bit about you that I know about you already. But, you know, uh, let the guests know about you. Like, so where did you grow up? I grew up half in uh, New Jersey and half in Pennsylvania, right around the Delaware Water Gap area. Okay. I had a parent in each, so I had the... Uh, Luxury benefit of kind of getting to be from two different places. Okay, um, that's great. The Water Gap in particular was a very massive influence on me in terms of what would go on to be uh, a career and lifestyle in terms of my exposure to the outdoors. Uh, started off with very basic, just, you know, canoeing, fishing, hunting, sort of things like uh -huh. that. And as I got a little bit older, it became a hobby and eventually it translated into a career. That's excellent. And in this territory of the northeast uh, especially in the pocono region it's kind of difficult not to appreciate what we have in wildlife and and the beauty part is we're only like an hour and a half away from new york city which kind of always blows my mind when i go back to new york where i grew up and then an hour and a half away i'm completely different world yeah absolutely it's it's hard i think for a lot of people to believe or realize, you know, you fly into Newark Airport or JFK <laughs> and you have a look around and you're like, all right, well, you know, I, I guess I've seen all there is to see here. But you get right outside that and it's amazing just how much natural their beauty is, a uh, natural beauty there is. The Northeast doesn't necessarily get the credit and reputation of some of its Western counterpart in that's terms true. of mountains and size and expanse. And well, that's certainly understandable. There's just so much beauty to be found out here. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, you get to the Western states, as you know better than all of us, it, there's less people, so there sure. is a lot less developed. Sure. And even though they're for the grace of God, the region that uh, the Poconos um, is developed, but it's not overly developed, thank goodness. And they're doing everything they can to allow nature to be a part of us every day. Sure. So it's great to see that that's happening. So there's a lot of area here that you can 
you can get lost then that's for sure absolutely there are some amazing amazing places tucked away that that a lot of people i think don't see or even know are there and that's that's great some of the best part about this area you know you know so you got into this business because of how you grew up right yeah so it was uh to be honest with you in the earlier stages of life it was it was almost more a hobby when you going mm -hmm. back to what you were saying about a connection with with nature and how important it is for us not just physically but mentally spiritually however you want to call it right uh it was something that i always found myself going back to it was the one constant i found in my life that's awesome uh being one that has a tendency to be somewhat impulsive which i think <laughs> has led me to liking adventure sports and adrenaline sports and things like that i would often find myself off on tangents but that that sort of connection to the outdoors and adventure in nature is what what always drew me back and in honesty almost drew me back to center i oh i came to realize eventually that um I best found my way in the world by becoming lost in the wild. You okay. Know, you get out there, and it sort of simplifies things. Nature right. can be a little harsh. Right. Uh, it can be a lot harsh, let's be honest. But a little it's, overwhelming. Sure, sure. <laughs> but it's a very, very simple, basic system of cycles. And I think once you can come to understand that, it sort of simplifies the grandeur of existence as a whole and makes it a lot easier to apply that to the hardships that we face in our day-to-day -day life. That's awesome. So, you know what? Keep it simplified for us. We're all amateurs other than you. So here I am, I want to go hiking, and one of the things that I struggle with, and I'm sure other people do, is I, I put a backpack together, and I think I have enough, but I never do. You know, I get like four <laughs> miles into the woods, and I'm like, damn, I don't have, I'm hungry again, yeah. you know? Yeah, oh yeah. It's like, and even if I eat before I leave, you know, it's you just don't realize how many calories you're gonna burn. I guess is that what the, is that what's going on here? Certainly the case, and it sounds like you're like me in the way that you're perpetually hungry. No matter, yeah, no matter well, what, you know, we got that high level metabolism. Right, right. No matter what I bring out there with me, I'm constantly hungry. So, um, but there's a there's certainly the aspect of of you know rationing and planning right. for what you're gonna have with you. I think it never hurts to have a little extra. Okay. There's some ultra lighters out there, you know, guys who count it down to the ounce that would probably contest me on that. Me personally, I don't mind the uh, the little extra weight for the little extra snack. Oddly enough, when you bring it into the realm of survival, right? they break it down in the rule of threes, which essentially tells you you have three weeks without food, three days without water, so on and so forth. Little guideline as to okay. what's priority. Food is unfortunately at the very bottom of the list. We can go okay. three weeks without it, but that doesn't mean I don't notice it very, very quickly. Right. Once I'm I just don't it. want three days of a bear chewing on my leg no, thinking no. I'm an appetizer. Certainly <laughs> not. Certainly not. We'd like to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> you would think, right? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. So, is there, when you're out there and I run out of it again and I got water because there's always pure streams. Sure. Where we are anyway, sure. in, in this northeast region. And it's funny when I see people from uh, outside the area, I run into them not so often because, as you know, in this area, you don't always run into people. It's few and far between. Sure. But when you do, and you can tell they're not from the area because I'm drinking out of a stream and they're looking at me like I'm crazy, like it's toilet water, you <laughs> right, know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which you and I both know it's far from it. It's yeah, you can tastes find better some, than what you can get in a bottle. You can find some nice right? mountain springs out yeah, here for sure. So I, I never, ever got ill. So, But anyway, folks, for those of you who are listening, you decide what to do, please. This is not telling you what to do because I don't know where you are and what you're drinking. <laughs> all right? But anyway... What do you do like when you run across something that looks like food, like berries or mushrooms? Where do you know and how do you know if there's something you could explain to us? Sure, you sure. Know, even if it's just a matter enough to get you over that starvation or that really hungry feel. Sure, absolutely. So something you'll constantly hear me say mm -hmm. throughout all of the different disciplines, whether it's climbing, surviving, hiking, you name it, wild edibles being the subject that we're on right now is the separations and the preparation. And that goes down to everything. If you're going out for a day hike, that's having enough food and enough water and enough layers, a uh, map and compass and knowing how to use them. Simple little steps that you can just take a little time beforehand that will pay off dividends if you find yourself sure. in, a, in a bad situation. Wild edibles is no exception. In fact, it's probably one of the foremost reasons to be well prepared. <laughs> it's an absolutely astounding uh, discipline. Okay. Um, something I find in incredibly impressive, <clears throat> something I enjoy learning about, and it's so vast because anywhere you go in the U.S., your wild edibles here are going to be different from the ones in Colorado right. and so on and so forth. The reason, 
But that is the reason then you want to be really, really aware sure. of, of what you are picking and what you're eating. We have a fair bit here in the Northeast. Berries in particular are a large abundance, but they're also probably one of the most deceptive. So what we use, and again, it's a general guideline. Uh -huh. I can give you a couple rhymes that we yeah. teach in some of our survival okay. schools. Yeah, please. That, uh, Make it simple for us. Are, sure, Remember, sure. We're that, never going to be experts. We're always going to be those weekend warriors sure, sure, sure. who get into trouble and wish we would have listened to this show. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. So again, these are guidelines. This gives you a general idea. You still want to check. Right. You know, Don't go rolling in just because you see a color. And the percentages right. will show you, will tell you why. But you start off with green, yellow, white. Green, yellow, white, okay. Dead in the night, all right? <laughs> all right, okay. So you have a 90% chance of berries of this color being poisonous or really? potentially fatal. So yeah. green? Green, yellow, white, green, dead in the night. Green, yellow, white. Yeah. Dead in the okay. night is the rhyme. That's the Green, that's yellow, white. All right. That's a ninety percent chance of of we'll call it failure of it, okay. of it being toxic or poisonous to okay. a varying degree. Red, good for your head, could still wind up dead. Okay. A lot, a lot of really nourishing red berries, uh, but it's 50 50 50 is a wide, wide. Yeah, range. that's kind of dangerous. Definitely. So again, going back to the idea of separation being in the preparation, the more you learn about your surroundings and the plants in there, the easier it will become to identify. Okay. There's a plant, for example, that we have in the Northeast called partridge berry. Okay. Uh, when picked, it has these two little dimples and it almost looks like a, like a cartoon pig's nose. Okay. That's your dead giveaway, telltale sign that this berry is good to go or edible. Likewise, any berry with a five-petaled crown, for example, our raspberries a or raspberry, blueberries, things blueberries. like that, are all edible. So any berry in the Northeast with a five-petaled crown is an edible berry. Okay. So it's simple little things like that. At first, you can sort of get the knowledge in your head, and then once you go out and you practice it hands-on, get a look at these things, you start to identify it, and it eventually becomes subconscious. Now, our last rhyme would be purple, black, and blue, all good for you. Purple, so, black, and blue. Okay, that's all I need to remember. Forget, anything other than purple, black, and blue, I'm not even going to consider. Right, perfect. That works. <laughs> now, it should, though, however, come with a warning. There is a 90% oh, chance. So you got 90, <laughs> right. Sorry. You got 90% chance of getting that right. So 10% okay. is still a fairly wide window. So I wouldn't say go out and start munching right. down every purple one out there. Plenty to learn. But if you're in a pinch, that's the area you want to concentrate okay, yourself so in. Okay, so purple, black, and blue. Black and blue. That's right. Now, so if it's 10% possibly not good for us, what could happen to us in that 10%? Are we talking like I need to use the bathroom a whole lot or um, foaming could, at the mouth? It or could be any of I'm the I'm losing above. my hair. It could be any of the above. I mean, it could be right up on... Or is it erectile dysfunction? Oh. Then I'm not touching any of them. Hopefully <laughs> not. Yeah, hopefully not. If there's one of those out there that does that, then I'd advise we all stay <laughs> yeah. as far away from that as Viagra's possible. Viagra's going to love us. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Right. There might be a market in it, I guess. There you right? go. <laughs> There's got to be a berry for that. <laughs> I'd say the best one for berries above all else in the Northeast, the no-fill that you can give people is any berry in the Northeast with a... Five petaled crown is an edible berry. Okay, so, and that's the so one you want to look for. We're looking for petals being green. Sure, yeah, greenish. Sometimes they're the a little bit darker. The petals being green. Yeah, but if you look, if you picked up like a blueberry or a raspberry, mm -hmm. when you pick it right off the vine, and it's got that little, uh, the the sort of like five pointed crown coming around. Okay, it. so there's five petals all the right. way around it. Right so around it's the top. Kind of there. like. Um, uh, it would be like a plate dressing, so to speak. Yeah, right. right? You could say that. Okay. That's going to be your most reliable go-to out here. There's there's other ones that are edible without it, but uh -huh. that's your. I'd say that's the safest bet. Now, is this consistent throughout our country? In North America, correct. In North yeah. America, so, which is important because we're talking, because you grew up in the Northeast and I now live here, uh, in the similar region that you grew up in. But our audience is all over the place, sure. even outside the country. So. I'm sorry for you who are outside the country. Um, if you want to take a picture of your berries and email them to me, I'd be happy to bother Josh with that. Sure. And sure. I'm sure he wouldn't mind as well getting some answers to you. Our uh, another good one for the north uh, for all of North America is all coniferous needles. Are what edible. the heck? You yep. know what we're gonna do? We're gonna take a break because I can tell this is gonna be a conversation all on its own. <laughs> <laughs> and what we're gonna do when we get back, folks, we're gonna to go to Facebook Live. So if you go to Rodney John Arabona, that's R-O-D-N-E-Y, middle name J-O-N, and last name is A-R-B-O-N-A, -A, just as I am as your host, because Facebook is not letting me go live on the No Excuses page for some reason. So we're gonna get around that by going live on my personal page that is public to everybody so thank you very much we'll be back in a few moments we're going to listen to a couple songs 
and when we return josh and i are going to go live so if you don't like the way we look that's fine there's there's things that you could mark up your computer screen with magic marker and i didn't tell you to do that because if you ruin your screen i'm sorry <laughs> we'll be right back after these few songs thanks for listening to no excuses and we are back, everybody. Welcome to No Excuses. My name is Rodney Arbona with my special guest, Josh Valentine, who's got an amazing amount of stories to share with us. And I'm looking forward to hearing all of them because I love the outdoors. I don't get out there as much as he does, but you know what? When I can do it, I always encourage everybody to do it. I say to everybody I know, there's a few things in life you need to try. You should try to ski or snowboard just to get yourself at the top of a mountain, Definitely. right? It's a beautiful scenery. Even if you're afraid of heights, don't worry about it. The lift never gets that high off the ground. And the other thing I say to folks is it'd be cool if you can try playing an instrument because not everybody has the ability to share their thoughts. But music is one of those things, even if it doesn't sound great, you're expressing yourself. Think of that as well. So Josh, let's get into one of your stories because I know you got a, so many great outdoor stories. Again, you're survivalist. We've learned about berries. So now I know I'm not gonna puke. What about mushroom? Well, mushrooms in general, we just say, let's just avoid them. Oh, uh, there are certainly <laughs> edible ones out there. Uh, morels, for example, are a, a good example. Edible, quite tasty. Sure. When you're in a situation where you're not sure, best and just just leave just mushrooms. Leave them alone. There are so many out there, and even if one's edible, there's X amount that are poisonous. The other right. ones try to look like the poisonous ones to try not get ah, eaten. Ah, like chameleons, huh? Yeah, right, right. There's a whole there's a whole whole bag you're getting into there that you may not necessarily. Oh, want that's to mess too with. funny. All right, um, so berries were going. They have to have four, five leaves around them. Best, yeah. One of the best things in North America is to look for a berry with a five petaled crown. The so five petaled crown. Your blueberries, your raspberries, your strawberries are some more commonly known examples. Right. But the five-petaled crown is always going to get you. Okay, get so you we're going to be safe with treat. that. So once again, folks, we brought up this conversation. I love to hike, and I'm always running out of food. Water, of course not. There's always a million amount of spring water and, and all sorts of uh, waterfalls that have great-tasting water. But I think this is important for us to know. So sure. let's go into other parts of the reason why you're here is not because you're just such a nice guy. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> Honestly, you know, the one thing I wanted to touch base with is you produced a trailer and a movie for ALS. Yes. So explain to us what ALS is for those of us who might not know, sure. why it's so important to know about this. Sure. So ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a very fancy scientific term for what I would say is fair to deem probably one of the worst adult diseases you could possibly come down with. In short, essentially, the motor neurons in the brain and spine that control voluntary muscle movement mm -hmm. rapidly deteriorate and die. So it begins with uh, minor inability to, say, use the hands or to walk, eventually escalates all the way up to you know, inability to move, breathe, speak, swallow, so on and so forth, until eventually... Wow. So uh, 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 let's take a half a step backwards because I know this is a lot to digest. Sure, sure. Uh, it's also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Correct. And That's I know uh, maybe not a lot of people know of him, but Lou Gehrig was a very famous baseball player for the Yankees. Yes. And it obviously ended his career because sure. you lose complete motor skills. Is that Correct. One simple way of understanding Correct. this. Yeah. So motor skills meaning all your muscles, your hands and arms, like you mentioned, sure. and then unfortunately it moves up into the lungs. Sure, just the ability to breathe, to br swallow, and talk, talk anything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's uh, it's pretty rough. So thank you for that. So what what prompt you to produce this trailer, this movie? So we uh, so the whole thing was produced by a nonprofit called Hark. Stands okay. for Healthy, Active, Responsible Kids. It was founded and is run by my good friend and nonprofit president Donna Derny York. Okay. Her father uh, passed from ALS. Oh wow! So I was first exposed to the disease. Um, I guess you could say via her father Charlie. So Donna's brother John was the GM at a restaurant that I worked as a server and a bartender at. And in the very initial phase of that, when I was working at a server, Charlie was there every day. Now, I grew up with Charlie's grandkids. Wow. And I had met him in the past. You know, I didn't know him particularly right. well prior. Uh, and I was kind of blown away when I first saw him because I didn't recognize him because of what you know, wow. the disease had done to him in its progression. But what blew me away from him was the fact that he uh, 
despite going through this, he was the most positive, upbeat, and just overall radiant individual in the room. That's you know, great. got all these people in the, hanging out in the bar with him. He'd come down to visit and hang out there each day. And uh, somehow he seemed to be the one that always seemed like he was living life to the fullest. Isn't despite the fact that he was wrestling with this horrific disease. Now, you know, you say this, and I watched this film that you guys produced, and it's heart-wrenching. Like, I'm, tears are rolling down my eyes. And it caught me double-handed because before I met you, um, and I'm not upstaging what you're doing, which is phenomenal, Hark, I want to talk about that more, sure. of course, is I saw uh, a film from Team Gleason. Yes. Which is, um, he was a football player for the Saints. Yep. And very famous blocked punt. Very, that's right. One of the most famous block punts in the history of all of football after that city went through a horrendous yes. uh, drenching of water, as we all know. And unfortunately, they, they did go through that. But what turned that city around was that famous block punt sure. where it that city got recognized once again. And it just brought so much more love into that city. So watching that and then watching yours, I tell you, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> but well, I but believe to complement what you're saying, they were both such positive people. Absolutely. You know, it's amazing how I don't want to grill the name No Excuses, but it's just like when I watched your film, it's like, how can anybody not be inspired by what you guys did? Sure, you said it best. I mean, the, the ALS patient epitomizes the No Excuses oh mindset. Goodness, I think yes. more than any of us even could, no matter yes. how hard we try, no, you know. And, and, and we'll discuss you climbing the Himalayas, which, <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> which makes it seem small all of a sudden, right? Uh, in, in, in its own right, yes and no, for sure. Um, but yeah, it, Steve Gleason's a, he's probably one of the better recognized faces of ALS right now. But something I think that he's done fantastically is he used that celebrity to sort of draw attention to the yes. reality of the disease. One of the things that inspired Hark in its particular mission. So what Hark does is uh, it focuses on real-time assistance for patients and families. That's great. So most of the money goes to research because obviously a cure is the ideal of remedy. Course. But of course. But... What Donna noticed uh, was that there is this sort of niche. There's a lot of people that, that are kind of waiting for a cure and don't have the financial resources or medical resources or sure. sometimes just outright emotional support to deal with what is an overwhelming thing. I mean, the whole family gets drawn into this. Right. A work, right. you know, the working member goes down with it, then the other working member of the family has to stop to take care of them, and sure. it, it affects children, loved ones. It's very, very difficult. Yes. So what Hark specializes in is going to the source and finding a way to help the patients. That's however great. they can. Uh, Steve Gleason has done a fantastic job of using his celebrity yes. to show what ALS really is. And something that I think contributes to a lot of that sense is that Lou Gehrig is probably the most high-profile high person that was diagnosed with it. Right. But people didn't necessarily get a sense of what it was. Sure. He sort of gave his speech and walked off into the sunset. That's right. And he was never seen in, in the latter stages. Gleason right. and, and, and his Charlie, wife. You know, Art Anderson, all the right. individuals and in Charlie. on the high horizon likewise. The courage it takes for people to go out and say, hey, look, this is what's happening and this is what I'm going through. And to in you know radiate inspiration anyways. Exactly. It's just, it's, like you said, it's no excuses. It's massive. It's, it's amazing. It really is. I mean, and I love the fact with what the organization does is get people with ALS to experience things they can't experience. Like you guys taking that person up a mountain, it just blew me away. I mean, it's like you need a box of napkins to watch this, and it's not even that long of a movie. It blew you know, just that trailer you sent me was like, wow, is this is unbelievable. It blew me away too. That was one of the most uh, incredible. The the entire experience from start to finish, even right up, even prior to the mountains, when just, sure. just was was. Absolutely life changing. Um, Hark teamed with a another nonprofit called the Adaptive Sports Partners of the North Country. They're based in New Hampshire, which okay. is where we shot the film, and they really specialize in that adaptive sport. So they'll take wow. people with ALS and other likewise, you know, other like disabilities, okay. and they'll take them skiing, and they'll take That's them great. mountain climbing, and they'll take them canoeing, whatever you know, whatever right. they uh, whatever they desire. Whatever that season do. is. Yeah, exactly. It's incredible. That's great. That's so great. Just one after another, it just kept exposing us to all these awesome people that are just, you know, similar mindsets in, term, in terms of helping others. So. Now, take us through a little bit about, and I would just want to share with everybody, um, how do they find Hark? I mean, I know we talked about it. So what is the simple way 
because I'd love to play this trailer, but we, we tried figuring out a way. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like we're going to have to play off the phone to the, to the, to the uh, set here. We're not sure how clear it's going to be. I'm going to post a link on both my personal page, folks, and the No Excuses TV radio show page tomorrow. So, and I'll remind everybody, and, and I'll get that post back up there. Just give us a little bit of a breakdown of, once again, what HARC stands for. Sure. And, and how can people, if they're experiencing something like this, um, how do they reach out to HARC? Easiest way to find HARC is to just go to the website. That's HARC.ALS, or HARC-ALS.org. So it's H-A-R-K. Correct. With a dash. Yep. HARC-ALS.org. Okay. And uh, there's a contact page there, and you click there, and you write your comment and your email, and that's going to go directly to Donna, and Donna is the one that runs Hark, and that's great. She'll get right back to you. Hark is definitely a grassroots level. We're a smaller organization, okay. obviously. That's um, fine. Um, a lot of the reason we made the film, uh, Hope on the Horizon, is to sort of you know send that message out to people to to that there are individuals that yes that are battling this horrible thing, right. but they're you know they're, they're they're still fighting, and they still okay need to have a voice that's heard. And, that's and, right. And Hark tries to, tries to emulate that in terms of hearing those voices and responding. And you time. can definitely see it. So Hope on the Horizon is the name of the video. That's the, the film. Of the yep. film, excuse me. Yep. And is that something they can catch on YouTube? The trailer is currently on the YouTube. Trailer. The full That's what... documentary is not. Uh, a lot of it has been used for fundraisers. That's awesome. So someone will contact Donna. Mm -hmm. We'll set up an event. Usually it's mutually organized with Great. their individuals on the ground. The documentary will be screened sometimes it's been everything from a bake sale to a raffle to right. it, it, it's varied all over and it's just been one incredible group after another that's that have set something up to help a fellow member of their community we've taken it literally all over the united states that's fantastic um but yeah the, just the trailer is available online right okay now. so um the name of the trailer again please Hope on the Horizon is the name of Hope the film. Hope on the Horizon is the film. Correct. And we can see this on YouTube. Sure, yep. Uh, it's okay. right there on the Hark website. Okay, well. so Hark, Hark. Dash ALS. Dot ALS. Uh, dot org. Yes. And then Hope on the Horizon on YouTube. You can see the trailer. And, of course, that will then get you back to the website, I'm sure, as well as sure. most as most trailers will give you that information. Sure. That's awesome. How long did it take you to make something like this? <laughs> yeah, I right. know. So... <laughs> From the idea's conception to when we completed the film was two years and change. Oh my goodness, I, that's a lot of work. So it was an odd concept to come to people with when it was just in a conceptual phase. Sure. I wanted to find a way to help other people. I didn't really have any experience in the nonprofit world. To be honest with you, at the time, and I you didn't... still don't. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. I've gotten better at least. Yeah, though. a little bit. Um... <laughs> I, the only thing I was really good at was the outdoors. Yeah, well, I, we know that. Right? And Thank God. <laughs> so, right. So I came up with this idea. I was like, all right, well, we're, we'll summit the 48 highest mountains in New Hampshire. Are you kidding In me? a single trip. That's great. And somehow there's got to be a way that right. that can help someone. There you go. Once I brought that idea to Donna, <coughs> we started talking about, well, maybe we can make this into a film. Maybe we can we can make a positive message out of that. Mm -hmm. And that eventually evolved into what we have And today. who's the producer for this? Uh, so Hark would be, I guess you could call the producer, okay. funding, so on and so forth. Um, it was filmed by myself, uh, my expedition partner, Kirk Leslie, and another okay. cameraman that came on board for smaller parts of it okay. and shot a lot of the interviews. And then all of together, it was put together by a gentleman named Mike Fiore. So he okay. did the post-production, the final editing, so on and so forth. It's, it's beautifully done. Yeah, he did a fantastic job. Beautifully done. I mean, this, it's 100% professional done. You, you could never tell that you don't have an idea what you're doing. I did then. <laughs> I can tell you. That was my first experience with adventure film. Uh, and it was certainly a bit of a crash course. Of course. But it was it was meant to be. It has really been a launching point altogether, mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole experience, the mountain expedition, the ALS aspect, and certainly the adventure film for what eventually went on to be a career. I mean, the guiding and the survival and stuff sure. and the mountaineering is one side, but the adventure film side has become kind of front and center in terms of what I do That's now. Great. So it That's was great. a fantastic sort of eye-opening experience all around. What's the, do you have another project on the horizon you can discuss? We can, yeah, in, in limited detail, sure. Yeah, I, I don't want to give look, away too much. I, I, all, I completely understand NDAs. I, I had a sign sure, to sure, sure. of my appearances on a couple films. We have a short coming out very, very soon, mid to late January, okay. called Embrace the Animal, which is all about wild locomotion, wild movement, and, okay. and just learning 
you know, how the body can really move through true resilience and raw wow. nature of the human That's body. That's going to be interesting. Very short, very action-packed. Okay. Excited for that one, certainly. I can imagine. And then we are currently in the post-production stage of a larger uh, feature length, which is essentially, it's a no-excuses mindset. Thank it's you. about finding individuals who have used adventure to overcome something very, very drastic in their lives and gone on to 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 contribute back to become not only awesome. only a self-sustaining individual but one that gives back and helps lift other people up so adventure was their therapy correct right? correct and as, and as we know again using the outdoors is is excellent way of therapy that you know one of my best vacations where i can say i completely eliminated any concerns thoughts stress and i go back to skiing again and I know it's tough for some people. I spent five days in Vermont skiing, and I don't want to pump Vermont, but I do love the state. Yeah, sure. Uh, five days straight, and I have to tell you, by the third day, it was like there was no worries in the world. It's yeah. like, you know, as you know, with skiing, you have to focus on skiing. Sure. You can't worry about, did I pay that electric bill, or did I forget to leave milk money for the right. guy who's dropping off groceries or something? Your brain is only tuned on a mountain. Absolutely. There's nothing else, but it's amazing what the outdoors does for f people. I can only almost wish I did what you did for a profession. <laughs> You're welcome to come out anytime. Uh, by uh, all we're means. gonna be talking about that, as you know. We kinda of hinted that in yeah, the background yeah. before we got here. But once again, it's just an amazing way, folks, to enjoy life, partake in the beauty of yourself. Absolutely. Actually. It really is. Absolutely. It was Sir Edmund Hillary, probably one of Arguably yes. one of the most famous outdoorsmen out there, first man to stand on top of Everest, who said it's not the mountain we conquer but ourselves. And that's Isn't that amazing? that's really the truth of it for anyone. Even individuals that, that I've taken out kind of hated the experience the entire time that they were in it. Sure. And particularly in the, the more extreme hated survival you? course. <laughs> oh, man. Did they, we, did a, we, we taught an extreme survival course. We were five days in the Scottish Highlands. Oh, wow. And, the other, and it was an incredible experience. But, uh -huh. I mean, it was rugged weather. You're getting attacked by thousands and thousands of these bugs called midges which are oh kind of like little no seams they get through tent mesh i mean it was oh my goodness it was impressive and there was one guy it's who like, he just it's like flying sharks yeah <laughs> basically yeah <laughs> mi microscopic flying sharks yeah. you could call them and one of the guys he you know he was i mean he had a great sense of humor super sarcastic uh -huh. but up and down man he was giving us all, all sorts of descriptive terms that i'll not repeat on the radio of course not but at the end he was just like that was just one of the most amazing things oh, I'd ever great. done. And there's, a, there's a gratification to that. There's My grandfather was a big outdoorsman. Sure. My mother loves the outdoors, but I credit my dad more than anyone to uh -huh. really exposing me to it. And there was a sense as this sort of career progressed of kind of passing on to others something that was passed on to me. Right. There's a lot of gratification to Absolutely. that. Absolutely. But, but going back to that sort of sense of finding ourselves, it's... It feels like you're competing against the elements and the mountain and nature, right. but in reality, you're you're competing against yourself. You truly are. You're testing yourself every moment of the way to see what your body can handle. Definitely. What your body can handle, and that sounds simple, but when you're out there right. fighting the elements, right. it's a lot more than that. You know, I've talked to people who've run marathons and. I have to tell you, a number of them said to me after they ran the marathon, it wasn't the pain or the dehydration. It was the um, mental part of yeah. it. Some of them said they even, they even started crying profusively uh, because they didn't think they can accomplish something so amazing. I mean, 26 miles, I forget it. I, I can't even talk for 26 miles. <laughs> I can't imagine running them. <laughs> Again, it goes through exactly what you were mentioning a moment ago is we can challenge ourselves. The important part is, and I want to reach out to a few folks, is I've been pleasured by many of folks who contact me about health and wellness because there's one of the things we do on No Excuses. We try to have a wellness dialogue from time to time. And I do get some private conversations of folks telling me that they don't have the physical abilities of something this drastic. But sure. there's also things you can challenge yourself on a much lower scale. So this is not about dividing people who can do things physically and people who can't. We're encouraging you, whatever you can do, take it to that point. Absolutely. Is that a better way of saying it, Josh? Absolutely. I think that people get caught up in the idea of... of the extremity of the, you know, the survivalism thing is very big on TV right now. Right. Or, or even when you mentioned the Himalayas before, people think about that. It's right. These huge mountains that are, you know, way across the, it's exactly. almost legendary. People get caught up in that and they get intimidated. One of the sort of missions that I've always had personally, but I think that's 
integral and general in the outdoor industry is to is to take that intimidation level down. Right. Not encourage people to go out and try something that may be out of their league or might right. be dangerous, but start small. Start small. Just get out and go on a hike. Walk right. a mile. Go 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 up to the Walk top a half of the water. A mile. Yeah, whatever's best. Right. Take it in. Even if you go out, find a nice spot out there, lay a blanket down, sit down, take That's some right. deep breaths and just drink the you know, the beauty of the natural world That's in. Right. You may not realize it, but it's having massive, massive it positive is. benefits. You know, there's, there's a part that I've read in a book of exercise yeah. and doing things differently. As we know, there's something called muscle memory. Bring that up because when you do things repetitively, you actually don't grow yourself. Right. When you make a change in your life, and like Josh said perfectly, even if you just walk a small distance and lay out that blanket that you said so perfectly, when you see something different that you didn't do the day before or two days before, you actually start creating new pathways in your brain. And that then releases more energy, those dorphins that you know about that people get from exercising, right? Right, But even if you're not exercising, you can release these chemicals that will make you feel not psycho, not just psychologically better, but physically better. Sure, absolutely. And it's important. That's a great point that you make about how challenge is good for us. I think you know, Horace said, adversity has the effect of eliciting talents that in prosperous circumstances would have there lain dormant. And I think that just rings true with everything you Laying said. That's true, no excuses <laughs> yeah. right there. Laying dormant is a bad thing for right. all of us. Too, too far into your comfort zone, you're never going to grow. That's true. Now, I know you got a great story about traveling the world in the Himalayas. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back to talk to Josh Valentine, my special guest. He's got some great stories. The man's traveled the world, the Himalaya Mountains. You know it. He's been it there. He's done it, so we're going to hear more about it, and we'll be right back, folks. Thank you very much. Are back? Are we back? Is this thing on? Yeah, we are back. All right, everybody. This is No Excuses. My name is Rodney Arbona, and I'm live with my special guest, Josh Valentine, and we are discussing so many different topics today. I can't thank you enough for everything we've approached. Your been my pleasure. Uh, you, uh, it's been hours. It's great to hear what's going on and what you folks are doing with promoting ALS and helping out on that because I know it's a very difficult topic. Certainly. Very difficult for the families that unfortunately have to go through, through things like that. I now know I can eat real dark berries out in the woods <laughs> and I won't kill myself. Finally, I have some spare food when I run out. <laughs> right, 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 right. 90% chance of getting it. Okay, right. well, if you have the 10%, I'll be calling you about right, it. Right, right, perfect. <laughs> if perfect. I get a signal. <laughs> perfect. So I know you've traveled a big part of different places in this world and it's been, uh, as you said earlier, your passion, but I also know it's been physically challenging to, in order to do something like this. So you did share with me you've climbed the Himalaya Mountains. I have climbed in the Himalayas. Uh, got back from Nepal the day before Thanksgiving. Wow. Spent just under a month out there. Good friend and climbing partner of mine led an expedition out there. He was gracious enough to bring me along as sort of his assistant guide. Uh, got the chance to help him bring a client group to Everest Base Camp. Wow. And then from there up to the summit of a mountain called Lobache East, which is about a 21,000 foot peak. Um, oh, is that all? <laughs> uh, a bit, bit, bit of a baby compared to the, the Himalayas, but okay. still, as high as I've been thus far, and it just, it was, it was immense. Um, I've been very fortunate to see some beautiful places in this world. That's great. And there was little I could compare the Himalayas to. Well, you know, let's just get through, like, what is it even like to get there? I mean, just, we're in the United States. The Himalayas are, like, halfway across the world. Yes, yes. Something one aptly notes when <laughs> traveling there via airplane. So my way there wasn't too bad. It was about 22 hours total. Oh, of, is that all? Of flight time. <laughs> Um, I can't take two hours sitting here. No offense, folks. I'm only kidding. I enjoy being with you. <laughs> it was about uh, 14 hours from JFK to Guangzhou, China. Uh, didn't have too bad of a layover on the way there. And then from Guangzhou, it was about four hours to Kathmandu. Okay. Um, from Kathmandu, we spent a day or two in the city, getting our uh, last few things together, supplies, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And then we flew to Lukla Airport which is the highest airport in the world. Okay. Um, and what's it like flying there? Like, are you on some rubber bands and propellers? Uh, it, more <laughs> or less. It kind of feels like you're flying in a maracca. You know what I mean? It, you get a very, very distinct sense of your own mortality when a wind <laughs> gust hits one of those little airplanes. I'll be honest with you. Um, I have no idea. You know in Indiana Jones when, like, the little red line yes. is flying across the map? Yes. I felt distinctly like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, my gosh. On the way there. And then you're – but you're staring out the window, and even though the plane's shaking and rattling oh in these God. wind gusts, there's just this horizon line of – 
These mountains that you've never like. I, I was literally like jaw dropped, staring out the window, holding my phone up. It's just oh my god, wow. oh my god, oh my god. You know. I'd be the smallest plane I bid on was a prop. Yeah, you know? yeah it's the same. Yeah. You know, a, but a bigger prop like right, you know, right, okay. like from uh, Puerto Rico to uh, St. Lucia. Excuse me. Right, I'm sorry. Right, okay. You know, and people said to me, "Wow, how did you handle being in that?" That's huge compared to what you were in. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was definitely uh, one of the more memorable flights in my life. The landing, uh-huh. then all of a sudden you're sort of looking and then. The plane you notice just starts to dive very hard, <laughs> and you can't really see. You know, you got bulkheads in the plane, right. you can just sort of see to your periphery. And looking down, I watched the wheels at the last second just land on this runway, which oh, it, it, was, it was basically a more or less like a Starbucks drive-through <laughs> kind of just carved out of the mountainside. It's a very very small airport. Oh god, uh, about nine and a half thousand feet roughly. Really? Yeah, and the plane just dives down i mean in fairness to the pilot it was an absolute textbook landing it was wow. impressive but having done it for the first time it's not a lot of warning that catches you sort of off guard and even though you know you're you know you're going to do this famous flight that right. you've always heard of as an adventure and always dreamed of the first time you do it you're like okay i, I see now where lookla gets its reputation okay interestingly enough we hop off we you know we meet the uh, Nepalese guys on our team, uh-huh. and we all head on up into the center of town. The whole town is just carved out of the mountains. Is it really? Cobblestone, yeah, there's yaks wow. walking past. It's an incredible <laughs> sight. And we come around the corner, and sure enough, there's a Starbucks. <laughs> Are you kidding half me? thousand feet. No, it blew my mind. <laughs> it blew my mind. That was certainly the last of anything like that you and saw. And what do you go. do? Put quarters in a machine? Do they really have people working? Yeah, there? Is yeah, it yeah. Legit you go in? Yeah, yep. Are you uh, kidding me? No, they got the whole town. <laughs> Lukla is a pretty cool little town. It's sort uh-huh. of just one sort of long cobblestone, almost not hallway, but it has that sort of effect. It's just one okay. almost linear setup. That's then, it. One street. Yeah, and then on the other side, uh, a yeah, Starbucks. You call they, well, they call the gateway to Everest. You walk okay. through there, and and you're on your way up and into the Solokumbu Valley, which is obviously oh the famous God. valley that ha- you know houses. Everest herself. So that's amazing. From there, we would trek. Uh, it's it's not necessarily the most considerable distance each day. What mm-hmm. you're dealing with more than anything is the altitude. Okay. So you're going up to Everest Base Camp is seventeen and a half thousand feet, and then as I said, Lobache East was was about twenty one. Um, so the trick to it really is just taking your time, going slowly. So you'll go up X amount. The first day you actually go down to a small town called Fakding. And, and then, is that allowed to be said on the right, 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 right. <laughs> could be could be interpreted as controversial, but I, I assure you it's the authentic name. <laughs> but what you do is we'll go up from there to a town called Namche so, and spend two nights at Namche, hike up one day, come back down. Namche was around 11, I believe. Basically, you leapfrog your way up and just take your time to give your body the opportunity to adjust to the lack of And oxygen. what are you feeling? What is your body feeling when you're, I mean... You, you live in a, we live in an altitude here in North America that even if you're in say Colorado you right. might be 12,000 11,000 sure. cuz i drove through Colorado and the highway was like 11,000 right. like, this is pretty wild <laughs> right. highway's 11,000 right. feet above sea this is amazing you know yeah but this is not the same atmosphere no no so interestingly enough i felt really really good okay so i had a fair amount of experience and exposure at altitude at this point Again, it really just all comes down to the acclimatization. We did a uh, climb and a shoot on Mount Rainier this past year. Uh, The first time we went out to shoot it, we had a nice two-week window laid out, and a freak storm came through and shut our climb down. Was that your preparation for this? Uh, You just happened to be doing this? In part, but we were actually doing a a, a film project out there as well. And Rainier is, so people who don't know. Rainier is in the Cascades Mm -hmm. out in Washington State. It is the largest glaciated peak in the lower 48. It stands at about 14,400 feet. Wow. Which is, until you get up into Alaska, more or less the the pinnacle height of what our lower 48 mountains are. So you're around 14, 14 and a half, generally. The Colorado 14ers, some of the Cascades. Um, We were shooting a story about a friend of mine out there. And we didn't get to climb on our first attempt because mm-hmm. a freak storm shut everything down. So we had to fly back oh, the wow. following, like a month later, to climb the thing. Wow. And uh, it turned out we went from sea level to the summit. In all, it was probably about 10 hours from where we left the car and so on and so forth. And myself and the other climber, Matt, there was three of us going up, Matt... Uh, we both just right around 12, 13, all of a sudden we really started feeling the altitude. You did. And what, what do you feel? What, what? Uh, it varies from person to person, but typically it's a mixture of symptoms, dizziness, nausea, lack of appetite, okay. disorientation. That, that's not fun. Right. Headache, difficulty breathing, 
uh, tiredness. Okay. It's a big one. This the sort of driving urge to go to sleep. And it, you, some people get a really bad headache. Other people get really bad nausea. I personally just noticed an absolute hindrance of my senses. Obviously, you could notice it mm-hmm. in the breathing. We hadn't given our lungs and our, our you know blood vessels time to adapt to the lack of oxygen there, and just my general sense of of sharpness. So, do you rest for a time period? That the is, cure to pretty much everything. Like is there is there a a a formula that you say, okay, I'm at this point of in how I'm feeling and generally it's just go back down really yeah go back down so you got to get away from that album right take some time had you had we gone up there gone back down and rested gone up again we probably would have been fine and how far down do you need to go if it's in any situation generally until the symptoms stop I mean the the higher up you go there's an unavoidable degree I think of of experiencing certain aspects Mm -hmm. of that why the reason I brought up Rainier was Going up to 21,000, I was well acclimated. Right. And I was up at 21. And I had expected an altitude wall because I hadn't been up that high yet. And all of a sudden, I was on the summit and I felt great. Whereas on Rainier, when we didn't take our time and we just shot up there, a mountain that we'd, you know, I'd been that high many times before. And it it really, really hit me. It's the crazy thing about altitude is it's very indiscriminate. It can hit anyone of any shape, size. Sure. You name it without warning. Health conditions, whatever, right? Yeah. The biggest thing was just getting. Getting up there nice and slow and taking our time, which sometimes is easier said than done. You know, when you get out there and you're feeling good, you want to push. You know? Right. Maybe that's just me. Uh, but Most but, people, we all want to accomplish what we want sure, to accomplish. And sure. That's always, I'm here, let's get to business. Right, right. Let's get things done. Absolutely. So now we're in the middle of the Himalayan mountains. and You're basically jaw dropped the whole yeah, time. Or at least I it? was. Yeah. I mean, it's it's... It's really an incredible sight. Um, is it that massive? It, yeah, it's huge. Is it it's, really? It's, it's huge, and it's just every time you think you've seen the most stunning view of your life, you round a corner, and there's a bigger, better one. Wow. Obviously, getting the chance to see Everest, as controversial of a figure as it is in the mountaineering world, right. world because of how many people climb it, it, it was just incredible. And how many people don't even survive from it. Right, right, is, right. You know, you got the oxymoron going sure, on Sure, sure. It's it just is mind-blowing looking at all of it. And um, how many people were you involved with with this hike, so this climb? So there was, let's see, between clients and staff, I believe there was about nine of us. Okay, that's yeah, a nice and, size group. Yeah, and that varied in degree. Um, mm-hmm. Not everybody went all the way up to high camp. Not everybody went up to the summit. So as, you know, people hit different points... Some rested in the village in Ferrache, some rested in Namche. People, you know, split up in accordance to how they were feeling. Okay. So So let's get into some of the fun stuff. Okay. I, I, I the camping I've done, there's always something that screws up, let's say. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like the adventure you know, begins when the plan ends, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, the plan is like even with today, you're just throwing the plan out. You got the plan, right. you, everything's gonna be set up and you, we're gonna do Facebook Live or we're gonna do this and before you know it. Poor James, I'm telling him, he's got music. He doesn't have it. I say you got it. He doesn't have it. So we say to heck with it. We just don't have it. We're just going to go without it. You know, yeah. Things just happen. So I know you're out in the wilderness. There's a whole lot going on. And I'm sure you got some, well, stories you're, you can tell us. I'm sure you got some stories you can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's go with a few that you can tell us. Sure. So, what do you want to know? Uh, something that you can tell us. No, I'm only kidding. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You talk about goes wrong. How about yeah. rough, rough night sleep? Okay, I'd say the worst, and this is this is a a, a night sleep that's uh, indigenous to our Poconos here. Okay, so it's probably a pretty appropriate story. A number of years ago, I was with a very very close friend of mine, one one of the guys that I really got into the the climbing and the you started getting into the more extreme ends of adventure with whitewater so on and so forth. He's now a guide in Alaska and Antarctica, but still one of my closest friends. Um, we were canoeing down the Delaware River. We were canoeing from its highest western tributary, as up in upstate New York. Yeah, as far yep. up as we could literally launch yep. a canoe. We launched it out of a out of a church parking lot because uh-huh. anything higher than that was just a little trickle. <laughs> uh, all the way down to Trent. So it, it's a hell of a hike. It took us about I don't know close close to two weeks, all in all. Okay. Not for any particular mission or cause, just the sheer fact that we could. Right. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we got the time walk, right, so let's do it. Right, so we got the bright idea one night that we were going to canoe at night. Oh, god! And it's the summertime, so okay. we're in board shorts and right. not much else, you know. And Was we, it at least a full moon? Uh, no. No? <laughs> yeah, but, we, but we had headlamps, and, and you know, we, we were on the, we were probably, we were definitely a little more overconfident, as we okay. often were in those times, and we probably would have been today, but... 
All of a sudden, we get caught in a massive electrical storm. Oh, my God. And, and you're on water. And on water, okay. yeah, with metal panels. <laughs> We're like, all right, we have to get off this river quick. Now, but as you know, even in the summertime, you get drenched yes. with rain, that core temperature goes down real quick, yeah, and does. you get cold. So we had little plastic Walmart ponchos, <laughs> and we had our board shorts on. So we made for land, and we found the one structure that we could that would house us and ideally keep us at least warm enough to survive the night, which just so happened to be a composting toilet on the edge of one of the uh, Water Gap Wilderness Preserves. So we held out at first. They're we, even there still? Oh, they're there. And they're very identifiable because they put off a very distinct Stink. aroma. Yeah, very difficult to miss. And it's not a dead animal. No, 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 no. Because those put out some pretty They do, smelly... they do, they do. Uh we tried at first to sleep <laughs> under just the awning on the outside uh -huh. on the concrete, but it was just it was cold. <laughs> oh, so God. finally we relinquished. We oh, went inside. And I mean, this is laughing. yeah, this is a, this is a summertime rainstorm composting oh. time. So the ground's just muddy. There's all oh. sorts of stuff in there, and it's a mess. Yeah, and we, we we're, we're trying everything we can not to sleep on the ground. We get up on the sinks, and this oh, is two you know this gosh. is two grown men. We were right. young, but still we were sizable <laughs> yeah. enough. Right, that one of us couldn't sleep on. They were trying to put our heads, you know, like laying over the sink and so on and right. so forth. And eventually we were just so tired and cold that we both wrapped up in ponchos and just laid down on the ground. Are you kidding? As close to one another as we could. Oh, you know, my God. And just passed out. Woke up in the morning quite confused. Was a bear licking you? I, I, would, I almost would rather prefer that. There's a strange, creepy, crawly sensation uh, going yeah, on. Yeah, there's a lot of things in these Yeah, words. well, we ever see those, those real big, thick, uh, like, millipedes yes. all over the place. Yeah, there was hundreds and hundreds of them. Are you They're crawling all over us. It was oh like something God. out of a horror movie. We woke up, obviously, throwing a proper fit, wiping these things all out, kicking us. just with... jump in the water? Yeah. Let's get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> enough, enough. Thanks, toilet. You saved a night. Oh, my God. And that one, I think, still holds as <laughs> the worst night I've spent. In, if you could call it the one. In, yeah. in, a, in a wilderness or camping setting of the interesting places I've seen, I think that still retains the trophy as the oh uh, least enjoyable evening well, sleeping in the water. So what part of your trip was it to Trenton? Was it halfway? Uh... Yeah, actually, I'd say we were probably around half. Halfway. Yeah, we were, we were in the we were we weren't far from Dingman's Ferry. Okay. So we were right around. We were right in the yeah. proper, you know, Water yeah. Gap recreation sure. area. And it's funny you weren't far from Dingman's Ferry, where the town of Milford isn't all right, that I'm far sure, away. Right, I'm sure. Right, right, <laughs> right, uh, right. Uh, uh, Darn, a more, a more wise man. <laughs> Rodney, where were that. you when yeah. we needed yeah, you? Yeah, but that, that that night he and I were just like, all right, well, I guess this is oh, it. No excuses, terrible. right? Yeah, in you go. Right. <laughs> Oh my gosh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it was a memorable one. Oh gosh. So let's go back to the Himalayas. What you've seen is is just got to be so breathtaking. I, I Again, I just can't imagine. And it's it's great you're sharing this with us. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. It definitely has been breathtaking. And it's I feel very, very fortunate and privileged to be able to have had these experiences and uh, you know, continue to have them and get to interact with not only people, but just these incredible landscapes and, you know, sure. continue to sort of push outside the comfort zone. Are you uh, ever planning maybe doing a production of that level? Yeah, you know, um, beginning with the Hope on the Horizon documentary, okay. the, the adventure film thing has evolved very, very organically. Uh, That's great. Currently uh, finishing this sort of feature length project that we have is is our primary focus, and then I think from there we'll reevaluate. But certainly, it's uh, it's on the horizon. It's, awesome. it's certainly a dream. It's in the dream uh, stage, it's in the well, imaginary stage. You know what they say about dreams, and what I always say about dreams: dreams is your mind and your soul talking to you about what you truly should be doing. So couldn't put that better. I don't thank think. you, and I know it's it's going to come to fruition for you. I'm back with my special guest, Josh Valentine, who shared so many uh, marvelous stories about his experiences in traveling the world and seeing things that most of us probably will not ever get to see. But it's even awesome the fact that he can share that with us. But experiencing the outdoors just for number one, right? Absolutely. And, and I love what you said before, even if it's as simple as grabbing a, a blanket and chilling out at a park somewhere and getting into nature. Uh, you don't have to be completely physical fit. We know there's a number of listeners who have some physical challenges. That's okay. Uh, it, the important thing is that you are doing something. Absolutely. I think one of the – so the, the core – when we teach wilderness survival courses, you know, there's there's a lot of flair and, 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 and sure. sort of intimidating aspects to the idea of certainly being lost out in the wild. But the absolute core function to it is choosing your attitude and choosing a positive attitude. Right. And as cliched and maybe even a little corny for some people as that may sound, it's the absolute imperative aspect to to surviving 
not only in the wilderness, but really anywhere in life. And in I life. Think that connection to nature is really, really good at reminding me about that. Right. And I think that that's a great thing for people to, to sort of draw from that as well. So it's, it goes back to what we were sharing and you shared with us more importantly, Josh, that when you do something different to your body, it really changes who you are as a person. Absolutely. And you've experienced that more than all of us. Sure. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if it's more, just in, in maybe in an abstract way from time yes. to time. But, <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. There's just no, there's no limit to the beneficial aspect of new experiences and, and, and new surroundings and it's new great. challenges and, and the medium of the wilderness and the wild. And it just, it gets you on every level, the mental, the physical. You know, you come out of something like that totally exhausted, sure. generally quite yes. uncomfortable, shot over it, done. And even though in that moment the idea of looking at another mountain or, or river or what have you, right. you're like, no way, get me out of here. The more time passes, the more you start to reflect and grow from that experience, you realize, you know, just just how in contact with your own self you came from. It. That's great. Right? Basically the defining aspect of my entire life journey, personal growth, the whole, everything, the true milestones I always wound up finding through that medium. Now, I've been accused of having a bit of a thick skull before, <laughs> so maybe that, you know, maybe that's the only thing they got through there. Heard my old man say that once or twice. I think I'd be hard-pressed to argue against it when he brought it up, so. <laughs> but all joking aside, I mean, it's just, it's, John Muir said the clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness, and I just, I that's found awesome. that to be very, very true. Yeah, I could definitely agree with that. Uh, so look, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I know you sure. got another story besides sleeping on top of uh, uh, a, a toilet bowl. We'll yeah. call it that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because my camping experiences gave me a ton of stories, and they're nowhere near as fun as yours yeah. could ever be of your experience. So I'm gonna again put you on the spot. Let's hear another sure, one. Sure, sure. Believe it or not, I do have one or two pleasant ones. Oh, we'll really? There, but let's forget that. they're not nearly as fun. Let's let's, let's go, go back to the to fun ones. Funny and uncomfortable. <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's funny when you were talking about um, just the diving and the snorkeling. Yes. I got the experience to do a fair bit of that in in. Um, Belize. Oh, beautiful. A good friend brought myself and a group of friends down there, and we got to go spearfishing with Hawaiian slings a couple days out That's on amazing. the second largest coral reef in the world. Yes, it is, outside of Australia. Yeah, God, it's absolutely stunning. Is it? Uh, same thing, just going and being very much an individual that for some reason generally goes to a freezing cold and icy place <laughs> in all my downtime. <laughs> being wrapped up in one like that was phenomenal. Um, it was my first time on a coral reef. And I did the exact same thing you did. I dove in there, and I had the Hawaiian sling, and I started swimming. And the next thing I knew, I popped up, <laughs> and my brother's over there waving, get back here. Like, I was, you know, probably yeah. further out than I should have been at right. first. But I got caught in a riptide in oh, wow. uh, Costa Rica, in the Pacific Ocean, one time. And that was one of the things that, you know, you're always told about as a kid, swimming right. in the ocean, make uh -huh. sure you swim sideways. And right. And you feel like at a certain age, you know, you're like, all right, I'm prepared for this. Let me tell you, it was definitely terrifying when I realized, wow, this is this is happening right now. You're this being is swept strong. out to sea. But I got to thank, yeah, right, right, exactly. I'm getting swept out to sea. Very, very, hum very, very humbling in the face of Mother Nature, particularly water. There's something yes. about water that really lets you know. Yes. Um, I took a swim on a whitewater creek in Colorado called uh -huh. Clear Creek, and it was Super, super narrow, but just rushing. 3,000 cubic feet a second. Oh, my God. You can picture a cubic foot as a basketball. Right. 3,000 of those rushing yes. past a second. It was maybe double the width of this room, uh -huh. two, three feet deep. So I felt like a pinball, basically. <laughs> By the time I got out, I was not looking too hot. But something you know, about and, water is just and, and you say pinball. For those of you who don't know what rapids are like, it's rock. So it's not <laughs> yes, like you're bouncing right. off a padded room. Right. <laughs> you're bouncing <laughs> off of rock, Definitely. which we're laughing at it now. But I, I, I can't imagine how much that would hurt because, you know, I've stubbed my toe on a rock going hiking. And that was the last time I went hiking that didn't have hard toes yeah. in, in my <laughs> hiking shoes. <Yeah. laughs> you know, like I've taken people hiking. Again, it's usually the city slickers who think they got it. And nothing against you city slickers. You know, I love you dearly. But it's funny when they'll call me or they'll say, Rodney, I want to come hiking with you. I've seen all these pictures you post. It looks beautiful. I say, great, come on out. Get your hiking boots. I'm coming out with sneakers. Isn't that okay? 
no <laughs> you know they're like come on what do you mean <laughs> no I, i'm gonna be fine i know what i'm doing i'm in i'm in great shape and you're like well, great shape has nothing to do with yeah. the possibility and the very great possibilities you know josh right, sure of slipping on rock and hitting an ankle bone or right, right. stubbing a toe or even just twisting one yeah, or right twisting out in the one. middle of nowhere right. and i'm like right deal. yeah right. you're six miles into the woods yeah twisting an ankle on a basketball court which i've done a lot of times and hobbling off is nothing like six miles into the woods and trying to go on uneven ground sure <laughs> sure and, and it, hobbling out <laughs> it's always the little things that get you going all the way back to the separation being in the preparation right? that's right we uh myself Two others did a trip into the Adirondack High Peaks, dead of June or July. Super, okay. super hot. Yes. It wasn't rainy, so not a lot Dry. of water. We knew that our predetermined campsite that we were heading to had a reliable water source. I like how you said that, predetermined. Right, like, right. It might be there, it might not. Right, right. <laughs> we knew there was water there. What we didn't count on is one of the three of us injuring their ankle halfway through the range. Now, this there is you go. sweltering it's heat, funny story. midday, and all of a sudden we're stuck way a ways away from our campsite with no water left oh, gosh. and an injured party. That's tough. So it's it, you, you couldn't be more spot on in terms of how very, very small things. Yes. Typically, a catastrophe in an outdoor setting isn't one giant one. It nope. can be, but usually it's a series of, of small issues that go unaddressed or unnoticed yes. that eventually compound to create a larger one. Yes. In this case, we were able to find a bit of a solution. So the only thing we could find up there, we're right around Gothic's Peak. You're not, you, you know, you're not even supposed to camp above tree line. Right. Um, <clears throat> We managed to find a small little the culvert's not even the word, almost like a divot, I think, would okay. be the best <laughs> description of it. It was the only spot that didn't have trees that we could sort of pitch a tent. Now, the trouble was, these were three men, three grown men, right. 200, 200 and change each. Right. And uh, it was probably about a man and a half's worth of ground space. <laughs> so, so we rigged the tent up as best we could, and we threw the sleeping bags in and said, all right, it's, you know, you don't have to hike down tonight. You can let your ankle rest, but we still have the issue of water. Not only do we have none to drink, but oh, we're parched, man. dehydrated. All of our meals are dehydrated and thus need water to be reconstituted so that we can eat. Right. And you need extra water to digest those because even as they're in your body, they're taking a lot more water to break That's down than right. normal. So we start sniffing around, and the only thing we can find are these just like sort of pock marks in the gray rock of the mountainside. Sure. And they're filled with, you know, inch, inch and a half, half inch of water, depending on which one. They're also filled with a layer of film right. and silt and yes. most notably Moss. dead insects <laughs> tons and tons of dead insects right. so <laughs> so unappealing as it sounds they're like well you know what as frustrating as it can be we, cho we chose to be here right so <laughs> it's time to make lemonade or in this case i guess you could call it mosquito aid maybe. yeah insects are looking good right about right now. <laughs> right so what we did is we we would kind of spoon this water into one container uh. and then put a handkerchief over the top of another. Right. Pour the water through the handkerchief, which got rid of the vast majority of the silt and the insects right. and all the wonderful protein-based undesirables yes. that were... From Eventually, we were able to fill about two Nalgene's, about two liters of water. Okay. Not too bad no. for scavenging through, you know, like sort of mud puddles right. on the side of a mountain. And from there, we went ahead and boiled everything on our little camp stove just to be, just to be extra cautious. And uh, we were able to split one dehydrated meal between the three of us <laughs> and uh, have enough water to digest it. And we had about a half a liter left in the morning. Wow. Morning took a little longer to get to than we would have liked. If you right. can imagine three grown men trying to occupy what is essentially the space of one sleeping bag. No matter what we did to try and get away from each other, you just woke up. Yeah. Chip to chip. Yeah, in a pile. In a pile. It was a mess. So it was a pretty sleepless night. Needless to say, we uh, we got down. We, we we didn't take our original route. We, we took a different one out just out of concern for his ankle. We uh, finally got to a stream. I think we each drank about three liters of water before we even left. And eventually we were able to hitchhike ourselves and our friends all the way back around to our truck. But oh, my God. That had have been a tough evening. It was a, it was, a tough it was, event altogether. It was quite a laugher, to be honest oh, with you. We had a fair bit of... It's, it's it's still it's still a story that brings laughs when we bring. I'm sure the three of you talk. It's uh, sure, sure. And I and again I can ex I can't experience that, but I can definitely understand what it's like, because I've seen people injure themselves in the woods, and I've seen as much as four or five 
six hours of fire department people trying to bring them down off the side of yeah. a mountain. Yeah. And, it, and I've seen these people hike, and I'm warning them as they're going up in sneakers, you, you're crazy for being here in sneakers. And they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm in great shape. So yeah. you see a lot of that, unfortunately. You know, yes. Yeah, so, and as the outdoors you know, are growing in popularity on TV, it's, right. it's that that risk is expanding. More and more people are right. kind of charging their way in without necessarily the practice. the preparation right. part that you talked right. about uh, fluently, and everybody needs to hear that because that's like super important. Mm -hmm. Definitely remember, you're going in on your feet. I hope you come out with your right, feet. Right. You got to protect your feet more than anything. Definitely. The clothing, I don't bicker if they wear the wrong clothes. He says, look, all right, you can deal with the shaping. I'm not. <laughs> as, long as, it's, as long as it's not cotton, yeah, yeah. you're good to go. You know, cotton kills. Uh, but other than that. I don't say a damn word as long as their feet are covered. Because, look, I'm not in a little position of carrying somebody out. Sure. Especially six miles. Sure. Especially when it's only the two of you. Sure. It's, it's hard enough when you have three people and one person gets hurt. If you got one person, two people, and one gets hurt. That's almost impossible. Uh, yeah, things can get, things become very real very yeah. quickly when that sort of thing happens. You know what? Time sure. is like flying by, my friend. We literally have like five minutes left, and we're probably closer to four, and I apologize. I wanted to go talk a little bit about uh, your organization, okay, Hark? Sure. And, and help our audience, uh, again, how they could better understand it and what little period of time we have. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So... Let us know again the website. Absolutely. So the website is hark alsorg That's H A R K ALS.org. And Hark is, was founded and is run by my good friend Donna Derny York. Uh, she lost her father to ALS and since has been a very, very passionate uh, advocate for ALS patients and families. Uh, what That's Hark great. does is if you have a friend or a family member who has ALS and, and they need assistance everything from hark has done everything from pay to help people pay electric bills to um pay the necessary expenses for an als patient to travel from the east coast to the west coast to attend a family reunion that they otherwise would have been able to hark has uh, helped fund and co-hosted camps for children whose parents have als to give that's kids awesome. a sense of oh, community an idea that that even though they're going through something hard other people are as well they're not the only ones. Right. They've uh, facilitated providing handicap vans, just about anything. You call Donna up, and even though she may not be able to give it to you right away, right. she'll do whatever she can to That's see great. to it that you get whatever help uh, is out there and possible. Um, again, hark ALS.org. And they can make a donation there. Sure, as you well. can donate there. All you got to, if you want to speak to Donna, or all you got to do is get on there and click contact us. And, and uh, sooner or later, right, you'll be one of Donna's back. team or herself. Yep, it's usually Donna herself. Wow, that's awesome. You. Yeah, she really, it's it, it's on a grassroots level, but that's part of the coolest aspect. You know, it's it's really this person behind it, and it's 100% authentic. That's great. And again, folks, we will post up the production, the video, uh, the film that um, Josh and his team have put together. Again, I can't thank you enough for being here. The film is amazing. Thank you. Thank I, you. I can't say enough about it, so I hope everybody does get a chance to look at it and partake, even if it's a small donation, 25 cents, whatever that is, um, even if it's just writing a letter to somebody who's going through it and let them sure. know you're thinking about them. Sure. You know, every little bit helps. It certainly does. Uh, ALS, again, Lou Gehrig's disease, unfortunately, there is no cure. Um, I'm not trying to end this on a downer, but the reality is there is no cure. It will paralyze their bodies at one point where even their breathing will be ceased and unfortunately at that point after that everything else does go but the important thing is we are here to expose it we are here to help hark as much as we can i would thank you once again i will post them as well on my website i'll get around to doing that so that's no excuses dot show i will put up a charitable tab that they can go to, and Hark will be one of the charities that I'd like to help out going forward as Thank well. Thank you so much, Rodney. You're it so is, welcome. It has been an absolute pleasure to be on the show. Oh, I you're so I welcome, my friend. Can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. I'm Hard glad. to believe it's been two hours. I feel like we've been talking for five minutes. I, it's so true, isn't it? Yeah. it? It goes by fast. It's just great information. I thank you so much for sharing your life with us. My pleasure. And inspiring our folks and talk about no excuses. Hark is definitely that. Well, likewise, my friend. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And here it is, folks. I thank you once again for listening, folks. This is no excuses. I am very humbled by everybody chiming in. 
And I thank you so much. Have a great day, evening, wherever you are. I know it's all over the world, so thank you. This is Rodney Arbona signing out. See you next time.